we're going to travel today to unknown territory, namely the Arctic. And I shall introduce you uh, to the Arctic uh, with a building that was built in 1992 to 96, which is called the Legislative Assembly Building in Yellowknife. In 1992, I was asked by the office of Matsusaki Wright to go to Yellowknife for the location of the Northwest Territories Legislative Assembly Building. It was an awesome request, and luckily I had read Arctic Dreams by Barry Lopez, who describes entering a new place as follows. What does one do when visiting a new place, he asked the man. His reply was simple, I listen, that's all. I listen to what the land is saying. I walk around in it and strain my senses in appreciation of it for a long time before I myself ever speak a word. Entered in this matter, the land will open up. And so it did for me on my first visit to Yellowknife in 1992, and of course again in Inuvik in, 90, in 2006. So here we have the distance between Vancouver, Yellowknife, and later Inuvik. And why doesn't this work? Okay. Yes, it does. Yes, here you see the Arctic Circle. Yellowknife is just below the Arctic Circle, while Inuvik is above the Arctic Circle. Now in Yellowknife, I was presented with this huge peat bog in front of a forest. This peat bog had been pilfered uh, by the citizens of Yellowknife for peat that they wanted in their gardens. And Skimo, uh, and uh, Eskimo now scooters and motorcycle tracks were to be seen, and the peat bog was looking forlorn. And the project manager from Public Works Canada would scream at me all the time, "You must restore the peat bog." And so I uh, started to think about how to restore the peat bog. The Northwest Territories Legislative Assembly Building was designed and built nearly 100 years after other capital buildings in Canada, in the harsh remote lands below the Arctic Circle. In response to the unique aspects of designing the new capital building, the site was carefully chosen to reflect the beauty of the scrub landscape and emphasize the architecture uh, which was uh, uh, which had to have a harmonious landscape uh, relationship to rock outcroppings, the peat bog foreground, and the lakeside location. And here we stand, thinking, where are we going to put this building? At the distance, you see Yellowknife, which is about two kilometers away, and here is the forest. There was a small clearing. And the architects, the engineers, and myself, we pondered, where are we going to put this building? The concept for the building and its relationship to its surroundings was based on the approach of least intervention. This involved maintaining ecological pro processes, uh, conserving biological diversity and utilizing ecosystems and populations of plants and animals at sustainable levels by dealing with key problems of conservation and development in a systematic and holistic way. The building was finally located at the lake. However, we all admired the wonderful rock outcroppings of the Canadian Shield and the plants that came out of it like little birches, nick and nick, and grasses. The building, as I said, is located at the rock edge of the lake. 
and is accessed through the space forest of 100-year-old spruce trees. These spruce trees are over 100 years old now. During the construction, a hoarding was put in place to protect the trees and vegetation close to the building. The trees are within two meters of the building, so we did not take any trees down. As with the peat abog, the retention of the trees was written into the contract. Site development guidelines were developed to preserve and restore, where necessary, the inherent beauty of the landscape, celebrating life in the north with the light and darkness, telling us about the seasons, introducing us to the plants of the region, as well as the need for preservation of fragile natural environments. So there are no nurseries up there. So how could I get plants up there for the restoration of the building uh, scars? There were some scars, of course. And so it dawned on me that we, I had to come there with a seed collector. Here is Bruce McTavish. He teaches now at Quantlin College to collect the rose hips, the, uh, the uh, nick and nick berries, uh, and uh, Vitus idea, uh, the blueberries, and so forth. So he came to collect seeds and cuttings from indigenous plants for propagation in Vancouver, a shoebox filled with 10 saxifrage plants generated from tissue culture 2,800 plants for the roof. This plant material was much genetically hardy, was then returned to the site at the time of planting. So here we see how the plants are nestled around, and this is exactly what we did after we raise the plant. So by plane, we took the seeds to a propagation facility in Vancouver. And two years later, we flew back with the plants in a freight plane uh, to plant them in the proper location. Now people have been wondering, where are the planting beds? Well, there are no planting beds up there. I just nestled the plants in the rocks. and. To restore the peat bog, um, I thought it was a good idea to collect all the very important plants from the peat bog in mats. And the contractor was so kind to you, uh, let me have his front end loader with a sheet of, like a cookie sheet across, and we just scooped up the plants and thereby restored the peat bog. These are cloudberries. They are a raspberry kind of plant, and the people collect the plants, uh, they see uh, the fruit, make wine of it, jelly, or eat it right away. So with these systems, we got all the plant material, which was genetically hardy, and returned it to the site of time of planting where it was necessary to build roads and paths, we choose, uh, we uh, choose uh, close to the peat bog, mats of the bog were lifted and used to repair construction scars in the bog. There was no available topsoil, and as a growing medium had to be developed, clay from the excavation was stockpiled on the site. We used some peat, but we also made, had to make the soil lighter, so we used sand that we found at the airport. And that was especially good growing medium for the roof where the saxifrage was planted. This method of site restoration is called invisible mending. Here we have the fen, with a lonely uh, Andromeda, yet I scooped it up to bring it to the peat bog. And here you see where we have planted, replanted already mats and mending the peat bog. And here you have this beautiful building wedged at the lake. 
and the lake had a loon every night crying and singing to us. And today, the building is a very proud addition uh, to Yellowknife. Uh, the trees in the last few years have grown instead of one inch a year between six and 12 inches a year because of uh, climate change, which is most noticeable in the north. Uh, another feature was not to touch the ground with an entrance to the building. This walkway to the building floats as you can see by the edges, so that little critters could go from one side to the next. And you can see the edges here very well. Also, we made a linkage to the town, a path that would take uh, walking people from the site to this town. And uh, they came along a f new lake, which is called Frame Lake, and uh, they could enjoy a really pleasant walk. This is uh, <coughs> the roses, they're <coughs> invisibly mended. And this path takes you to the town. Originally, I wanted this path to be in gravel, a sort of crushed gravel, but unfortunately, when I came upon it a few years later, it was with pavers. And you wouldn't believe it, last year I saw it with asphalt horrors. And um, the grasses are seeded along the path, so we did not disturb any of the vegetation. Uh, the roof is planted with 2,800 saxifrage plants and is a green roof, like I like to do down here too. And this roof, by now has colonized, is colonized with birches, little Douglas, little spruces, and all sorts of plants. So it is part of the whole ambience of the surrounding landscape. Here you can see uh, dwarf birches. All the plants that colonized on the roof are um, dwarfed. They will never get much bigger. And here is a beautiful picture of the winter scene, the quietude of the winter. Now we'll travel a bit more further north. Uh, this takes another, if you get to Yellowknife by plane, in the olden days I would fly to Edmonton, and then from Edmonton I would fly to Yellowknife on a plane that was half freight and half people. Now we have a connection for just people to Yellowknife. Then the next morning you get up and you go to Inuvik. So it's a two-day journey. And you st uh, stop someplace uh, at, Mo uh, at Norman Wells and you see the beautiful areas around there at the Mackenzie River. And Norman Wells has just been declared a park uh, by Mr. Harper, but it was supposed to be 8,000 hectare, and he realized that we had mining possibilities there, and so he shrank the park to 4,000 hectare, which is very sad, and I don't know what's going to happen there. So we are now going to Inuvik. In 2006, I was asked to collaborate with Gino Pin, the same architect who did the uh, legislative assembly building for a new community school to be built in Inuvik. It was a great experience to learn about another community and its vegetation, and the melting of the permafrost was most obvious already in 2006. But if you told that anybody down here that I saw the river instead of a vegetated slope, I saw the water coming at me, they wouldn't believe me. Now, maybe people believe there is climate change. The town of Inuvik was founded in 1963. And here, is, here are all the credits for the school and the teamwork that I believe in. And this is Inuvik as a little town lying on the east 
arm of the Mackenzie River. The Mackenzie River Delta is a microclimate where things grow quite well. And in 1963, Diefenbaker, Prime Minister of Canada, came to dedicate this town because the town of Aklavik, which was the, company, uh, the town for administration before, was in a wet-lying area and people had to be moved. So he dedicated this town, uh, and uh, Inuvik means the town of the people. Uh, this town is uh, lying in the area of the Mackenzie River Delta with uh, beautiful forests around and is uh, growing slowly. Uh, there are today 3,400 people living there. Uh, this is from the air, what it looks like. And uh, here you have this fantastic green, luscious green of the uh, Mackenzie River Delta. Uh, the Mackenzie River uh, originates near Yellowknife in Great Slave Lake and continues all the way to the Bo Beaufort Sea. Uh, this town uh, has uh, uh, grown uh, and extended itself, and the center of the town is for a church a s and the school and a college. And how do the people live there? They live all in small little houses. And the most peculiar thing is that in between the houses is a function of sewage and water transport. And it's called the utilidor. And you have that every other row of buildings. Now, in the olden days, which I call before climate change, the population, which is composed of roughly out of three different uh, uh, groups, Caucasian, of very mixed Caucasian, 30% uh, Inuvialut. These are the Inuits that live there. They came from Siberia maybe 200 years ago. And they're very different from the Inuits in the Eastern Arctic. However, they have whale hunting. And in the olden days, they could hunt a whale. They could go out in their kayaks and not worry about anything. But if you listen to the radio last week, they had to be rescued because the ice floes were so thin. They couldn't stop. They were just floating around. It was very serious, and the helicopter had to rescue them. Uh, they have a song which they sing when they were kayaking with the whale, and it's a beautiful song, and I heard it sung, and since I can't sing too well, I would like you to read it. Tag, tag along, E-I, E-I, row, row. And today, that is not possible anymore. So I came there, and I had to learn a great deal from the elders uh, about the relationship of plants to the land, the sea, and it's as described in the book in Violot. The relationship between Arctic plants and the Inviolot is only one of many within Inviolot life and culture. However, it is compelling. There is a shared story. They have grown together. The mere range of roles played by plants in the Inviolot life speaks directly to the breadth of knowledge nurtured over generations. The Inviolot names, uses, and spiritual collection with plants expresses the beauty and complexity uh, of the land, reaching out to the depths where there are the people. This is an inheritance that deserves the utmost care, attention, and respect. It belongs to the legacy of the Inviolot, a legacy that they continue to live. Now, this came to me 
right away when I came the first time in 2006 to, uh, uh, to uh, Inuvik. And here is our first visit. There's Gino. And he um, was showing me where the school might be. This school, the, Arch uh, the Mackenzie School, had to be replaced because of the melting permafrost. It was sinking, and you couldn't possibly pop it up again. So 2006, we were already understanding climate change. So here goes Dino with me, and he shows me this piece of ground, gorgeous pine trees, uh, larches, birches, understory of willows, little cranberries, blueberries, gorgeous. Well, right there, in the middle of the picture, I sank into the permafrost that had melted. And it certainly was not possible to use that site. So we had to set, up, set out to find another site. Here it is. Here, right here, at the very beginning, I sank into that permafrost. And uh, you couldn't use the pass. It was just a mud hole. Uh, this was the impressive boreal forest. And I immediately said to myself, uh, oh, this is a town. This machine shows everything twice. Excuse me, please. So I have to look. This is the town, all the little houses, and in between is the utility door. Where the blue arrow is, that is where we built the, next, the new school. We left all the spans of beautiful green uh, around, untouched, because the use for uh, cross-country skiing was good and uh, the use for collecting berries if you wanted to sink in the mud was also a good. So the school was to be built on this site that had been used. This boreal forest and its undergrowth was the inspiration for the landscape of the school. You see the dense undergrowth of berries their vitus idea, a form of uh, blueberry. These are the most important fruit for everybody to enjoy. A bag of oranges in Inuvik with six oranges costs uh, $20. Uh, tomatoes cost $9.08 for half a kilo. And so the nourishment and the food value that uh, the people who live there need must come from collecting the food. And the Inuvalots are doing their best. And the other tribe, the Wichen, had, the Wichen tribe had written a beautiful book on uh, growing the plants that are needed for food, and also explained where they grow. It's a very wonderful book, and added recipes so that, for instance, the home economics teacher in the school can teach from this book. Inuvik has also a greenhouse. This used to be a hockey arena. And the University of Alberta made it possible that uh, they would come up and uh, help to make this a greenhouse. Here is the greenhouse. Gino is just going in, and this is what it looked like. People have plots, and so in the summer, people can grow their own vegetables. It's just like an allotment garden down here, and urban agriculture. So now, what do we do? We look at the site, and this was going to be it. Barren, full of puddles. Yes, that's what it was. Over the, uh, this is 
the project brief about having to take down the Alexander Mackenzie School and the Samuel Hearn Secondary School. And this was revised and issued for design May 2006. So based on all this investigation, we were quite sure that the site that we found was good. A cultural report was written in December 2008. Uh, that's not just a thin little report, it's about the sick, which tells us that the culture of the people living there had to be incorporated in the school with hunting, with uh, textiles and everything. The next very important report were the snow drifting, the wind studies. Snow drifting in Inuvik was never as visible as in the last five years or six years. A huge amount of snow drifting was visible piled against buildings and um, the snowfall isn't that much in, in Nuvik, but the wind. The wind does bring these masses of, uh, uh, of snow. And then we went into a microclimatic analysis, which was very important, that showed us where the winds came from. It showed us also where the drifting occurred, and it showed us that the wind that used to go over the town went now at a three-foot level so that a small child could no longer open the door without being hurt by the wind. So that was very important to learn. Here is the comfort category is in the winter. All this was very uh, much discussed in detail at a charrette which we had here in uh, Vancouver in um, March 2009. And uh, that really set the date, uh, the stage, how to work on the school. This is a little dark. Uh, but that shows you lots of darkness up there. <laughs> <laughs> there is, there is uh, in the summer, of course, 24 hours of daylight. And on January the 6th of this year, they had seven minutes of sunshine. And they had a festival, and they danced, and they were very happy because now the days are getting longer and there is a darkness which is very depressing, is veiling. Well, how do you build in the Arctic today? It was customary to put piles down, 10 feet down. These piles for the school vary between 10 meters and 30 meters. That is how you have to build today. So that is a huge amount of cost for a building. And here you see the piling, and you see that the school is raised by about two meters above, and the landscape architect had to do something about that. So we built with Gabion baskets and slopes. We built away from the school in order not to have people fall <coughs> into the two foot, uh, two meter vacuum. So all this had to be very carefully figured out. The school is clad in aluminum, which is a very durable material. And the Gabion baskets, as you know, they come ready made and you just fill them with stones and they are your retaining walls. So that was a very cheap idea without footings. This is a school in the winter before it was finished. And inside the school, here you see it at this point in the winter, planted with the trees and the upright land standard. 
and the lighting inside. However, the inside of the school is absolutely beautiful. It has all the features that you would want to have. It has colors. It has the weavings of a bell. This is the weaving of a bell on the wall. It has the northern lights on the wall. And this beautiful sketch is how the children come to the school. Uh, Gino is an expert in getting light into the building, whether it's summer or spring or night. He feels the children, when they're in the school, even in the darkest days, must see the sky. And so the corridors are interrupted by these beautiful skylights, which uh, are very exciting because you can, even in the darkest days, gather the stars on the horizon. Inside the school, lots is happening. The children have nice places to roam around, and the lockers are all colored, so the children don't have numbers, but they know the colors of their lockers. Mm -hmm. And uh, the halls are beautifully laid out with all the animals uh, of the area, and the floors are with different colored linoleum. The library is a very important part. Uh, this is a sketch for the library, uh, storytelling. Uh, Gino is an expert in having outside, outside the classroom always corners where kids can meet. And here in the library, they can sit, they can lie down, they can tell each other stories, or they can just relax. It is a very wonderful piece. And here are my grandchildren um, who came with me up to Inuvik. They were hired by the construction crew. And we are relaxing a little bit in the library. It's all carpeted, and it's very nice. The corridors and the, uh, the school is a community school. The mi middle section of the school is for gym, drama, a little theater, and then has a gymnasium with wonderful pictures on it. And it is great fun uh, to uh, think of the community coming in the evening to play games here. This is the theater part, a stage set as you see, light all around. And then uh, this is for performance with chairs. And here's our first performance. Kids can sit this way. Kids can sit the other way. It's a school that is very flexible. And in the um, outside, there are shades uh, of northern lights uh, to shade you from the sun in the summer. This is what the school looks like today. And of course, you have snow drifts all over. And uh, here is the countryside next to it. And these are the first trees that we transplanted. Now, how do you, de we had, to, in the charrette, we had to make sure that everybody understood the wind and the snow drifting. And it was decided to design a shelter belt around the school. A shelter belt could be rows of trees, but the wind would go right through it. And so I thought of the idea to simulate a Buckminster Fuller grid and have the trees irregularly placed where the lines cross. And these trees are larches, birches, and spruces. How do you get the trees there is another question. Well, we had to decide uh, where to get them and had to have permission from the town to 
uh, to dig uh, the root ball the year before transplanting. And this was done in 2011. Uh, the school, aside from the shelter belt and the planting, has also other facilities, namely uh, facilities for play. And this shows you that they are all going cross-country skiing, uh, which is co possible right across from the school. And then in the charrette, we sat down, uh, we sat down and thought, what do children like? What do they want to uh, play with? And how do they play? We couldn't have, we would never use equipment from a catalog like playgrounds here, but everything would have to be constructed from logs <coughs> from the Mackenzie River. So we started to think about it, but then we have also the learning from the elders on the playground. And so that was another phase, uh, phase of working in the Arctic. Here are the sketches for the playground, the kindergarten area, and it looks pretty much like that, uh, which we made in 2009. And uh, here you see the school, the total, the center is the community area. The, at the right end is the kindergarten, elementary school, and the rest is the high school. And these are sketches which we made, and uh, hopefully they were meaningful enough to put into reality. This is the first attempt on showing our various outdoor areas with hillocks and a round circle for special games, a middle school playground, access with bridges to the school, parking areas, everything thought out. So these uh, are the design sec these are design sections to show you the three to one slope and two to one slope. So that Public Works Canada that was in charge of all this could realize that we were not doing anything that would be li uh, for liability. So here is the digging, here is the digging of the uh, root pruning of the trees to be lifted out this year. We found out, however, that we didn't really need to do that. You see this experiment goes far and wide because it's so shallow rooted you could just take the trees and shift them over. <laughs> uh, here is a picture of Anneke. She's an ecologist at Aurora College and taught us a great deal about spacing of the plants and also the plants as they grow in the forest. So again, what do we do? We need a seed collector and a plant collector to do the planting around the school. We had the trees, they are root pruned, they can be lifted out, they can make the shelter belt with the design that is uh, agreed upon. But now we have to get plants, the edible plants that I showed you. Well, Haley Asian from uh, Nats Nursery, I'm sure that landscape architects know that we have a fantastic propagation facility in Langley, went up with uh, Haley, uh, Agen, and went up with um, uh, the ecologist from, uh, Ilona, uh, from Inuvik to collect the seeds. So here are now the seeds, they're in being puddled they have to be wet. Then they go into a refrigeration. Then they go into a warmer frigidaire. Then they hopefully will germinate and be plants. Well, that took from uh, 2008 uh, to, no, 20, nine, uh, 2010 uh, to 2011, all that preparation. And in 2012, we get 
all of a sudden a ghastly announcement that we have to be ready with all the quantities of plants from Nets Nursery um, in 2012 for planting, which meant that we did not have the plants in six inch pots, but just short pots. Here we show you how the plants grow in the facility at Nets Nursery and how the plants are little plugs and far away from six inch pots. Here you see, this is Nikonik, very useful plant. And this is a short pot with roses. That was last year when we went to see them before they were shipped. These are the roses. These roses were very important because they were guarding uh, where children shouldn't go. And here they are ready for shipping. And uh, here is a truck that is taking everything to Inuvik. Now, uh, to go to Inuvik uh, is a nice idea. Uh, and the Dempster Highway is passable. So stage fright in the office. When are we going? How are we going? Is the road passable? Is the river navigable? So anyway, finally, the truck left on July, after the July holiday and uh, brought the plants to Inuvik. That was the last shipment on the Dempster Highway for two weeks. Can you imagine? Because there was a mudslide and a landslide and the river ferry broke down. So we were, had more luck than brains. <laughs> so here they're being packed up in the best way. And as we came on July the 10th, the trees had already been set out and uh, everybody was waiting for the plants to be, uh, to be unpacked. Here they are coming and here we are very proudly unpacking them from the various places and then setting them out. Uh, setting them out, watering them, and uh, the girls had to take all the plants down, assemble them by varieties that nothing got mixed up. And then we started to see that there was a thunderstorm, a terrible thunderstorm, which left puddles all over the site. So here we established ourselves uh, as a team in the office of the uh, contractor and we had to revise the whole planting plan because of the puddles that did not go away. So that plants like blueberries who like wetter ground would be planted on wetter ground and plants like roses on higher ground. So whenever a drawing was finished and the uh, quantities had been uh, calculated, I would run out. Here you can see it very clearly. I would run out to see that everything would be in the right place. This is a plant list. The plant list was reduced by public works behind our backs because people were scared we wouldn't know what to do and also that it would cost too much. Now the landscape is uh, that we did was under $500,000, which is nothing. And uh, here we are storing plants, putting plants on trucks, setting out plants, and that had to be all very quickly done because only we had only 10 days to work on this. Here, the moment a drawing was finished, I would go and set out the plants. and they had to be planted very quickly. Here is me setting out plants, others are planting. The red line would be the bottom of the slope so we wouldn't plant any further. And so we walked backwards and forward and got our exercise. And this is the happy team. 
I don't know if Ainsley made it. Is Ainsley here? No. Oh, Ainsley, I'm so glad you're here. Well, he commandeered us all around. What's that? He, you commandeered us all around that you needed everything right away. Ainsley was a project manager for North by Northwest, and we had a fantastic time. Uh, then we needed somebody to water, and he came when, when they needed, and you wouldn't believe it. Six weeks later, the rose bloomed. Uh, and the rose bloomed because it had the seasons all mixed up. <laughs> <laughs> this is what I longed for. This is the knitted ground of the boreal forest. And I saw it. Uh, Annika took us there, and I loved it. And when I left the site, I cried because the plunked down plants looked like cow dung. And I was thinking, oh my god, this is not a garden in Vancouver where you sit out plants. Will they ever knit? This is part of the playground. <coughs> Six weeks later, please look. These cow dung plants had knitted, and they are perfect. And so now I'm waiting to see what happens in the next season when the snow has melted and the cold of 50 degrees has vanished. But all these plants are genetically true to the north. Here you have the whole beautiful area. The seed uh, is a native grass seed that we composed. It came from pig seeds in Ontario. And it germinated within 24 hours because of the long daylight. Now, the site is also made for games. And these are games that are played by the Aboriginal groups. This is the blanket toss. And now we have the winter, and here we see the beautiful landscape. The trees are poking out, there's much snow, and yet there are also games being played with arrows, and the kids play by themselves on before the snow came with chalk. And this is another area that has knitted, and the beautiful uh, canopies over the window. And here the children frolic outside, mothers fetching them from the school or they're going home. And all the grass has germinated, so it wasn't too bad. And one little girl decided all on her own how to play by herself. And this is what you want. You don't want them with playground equipment. You want them to invent their own little places to go. So uh, this is the making of and building the school. However, I would like to address climate change. In 2012, we celebrated the International Polar Year. The conference took place in Montreal. It became evident that 150 million people will be displaced by 2030 due to climate-induced ecological change, which is called climigration. Furthermore, changes in permafrost and ground stabilization show that we have to build differently, which I showed you we did. Nowhere is climate change more noticed than in the Arctic. The impact of food security changes traditional hunting, food gathering, and storing. They used to store their food in what they called ice houses, which were just around the town, like little caves. But these ice houses are no more uh, uh, freezing over as they should to store the food. So food storage up in Inuvik has become a great problem. It all points to the importance of use for understanding local foods. And this is what this school is supposed to do. The native foods can be harvested here. They can learn to cook with this cookbook. And the school addresses all these problems. 
most evident was the climate change in the Arctic with increased temperatures. This summer we had 27 degrees centigrade. Sea ice degrading, I showed you they can't uh, go by kayak anymore and get a whale. Degraded permafrost, enlarged ice melt on Greenland, where we witnessed in July that a whole glacier fell into the ocean. Increased water vapor, decreased snow extent, increased number of forest fires, quite noticeable up north. Increased river discharge, we just witnessed while we were in in Nuvik that we couldn't drink the water because the wo a landslide went into the Mackenzie River and it was so murky that we could not drink the water. Uh, and a resulting ecosystem impact. The ecosystem is definitely impacted up in Inuvik. This can all be described by the term Arctic amplification with consequences for all. It is essential, therefore, that initiative for public policy be adapted everywhere for environmental sustainability as for development, including food security. We've come to a point where food security and climate change go hand in hand. Advocates for both the built and natural environments will need to collaborate to meet these current and future challenges, which I demonstrated just now with the slides there on the PowerPoint. In conclusion, a new model for landscape architecture is needed. We must practice what I call the three R's of every project. Responsibility, taking responsibility, taking risks, and doing our research, which involves both analysis and synthesis. Above all, we must learn to collaborate and engage with related professions. You can no longer do things by yourself. You got to have a team. You go forward with the team and you do your work. What Above all, we need what I call VIM, namely vision, imagination, and motivation in order to accomplish these goals. If we want to keep the biodiversity around us and keep the world green with healthy settlements and healthy people, there's no time to lose. If we want landscape architecture to become the art of the possible, we must discover new aesthetically pleasing solutions that are both ecologically and technically sound for all regions. The planet is finite. Land is a resource, not a commodity. We must never forget that. We must limit our footprint on each site. We did that here. This is limiting footprints, this building. It sits exactly on the footprint of a former building. It was a sorority building. And we had to take it down, and we did not go one foot beyond this footprint. Uh, but uh, we must reveal a new dimension and respect nature and beauty. In the words of David Suzuki, who points us in the right direction, recognize that we live in a world where everything is connected to everything else, and so whatever we do has repercussions. There is a tomorrow, and what we do now will influence what tomorrow we arrive at. We owe to the future generations to think about them before leaping ahead. Thank you.